I'm gonna play uh, the first song I play is called So Long. idea that it's a bunch of different yous that were on stage so it's it's what you would do if there was more of you if you were a guy with a with obviously I don't have a, I just have a guitar so if I, if there was 10 of me with guitars on stage somehow that's what would be happening the one man touring show. That started somewhere around 2003. As a, as a, actually in that it started earlier, that started in 1998 or something when I became a, um, a solo musician as opposed to a drummer for a band. And then that would have been the first time to start um, trying to learn songs to play solo. And then the, the kick it got to ignited into reality might have been discovering the loop machine and spending one afternoon uh, toying around with that to get uh, yeah to get the idea that it wasn't some sad ass guy on stage all by himself that it might have some further interesting potential I just remember some people I worked with when I was younger Stuart Thomas in Melbourne and watching his 
just the the love he had for music, you know, and how he was he was just tinkering with it the whole time, and somehow that really inspired me to have have a hands-on relationship with it, and this idea that it's this thing you can keep keep exploring and opening it up and finding more and more in it with just a really crappy guitar. Whatever you have, you can you can spend hours lost in this crazy world, you know? almost enough to form a song and it's just there you wake up in the morning and you can sing it and you can write it down and if you don't do that within probably three minutes it's gone you never find it again Yay! one thing for me I really like about songwriting is that you start with nothing you're sitting down there's nothing there and then after half an hour maybe an hour, maybe two hours, maybe 20 minutes, there's something there that is completely undeniable and tangible that you will become obsessed with for the next week and can't put down. until you feel like it's a song that you can record somehow or demo and then you can let it go and you can listen to it a couple of times but it's kind of done. But it comes from nothing and then all of a sudden it's there and it has the, it has the flavour of a Delaney Davidson song. And it's like, it's like people who write songs or create things they're kind of like barrels, like you have these old burned out whiskey barrels or whatever you call them, oak barrels, and each one has a distinctive flavour that whatever is, comes through it or is distilled in it takes on the flavour of that person or that creator. And I keep being surprised. There's so many songs out there to discover that have that flavour that I like or that particular twist on them that I enjoy. It's hard to find what inspires you. Well, I find it hard. Often it's, um, often it's movement, but then often it's a thing of just putting in a little bit of time. If I started to say, okay, I'll clear out the next two weeks and I'll just sit here and I'll, I'm gonna write. The first day might be really horrible and I might not be able to get anything going and probably a bit of tomorrow wouldn't be much fun either. But then suddenly after like pushing down, you would get to this place and you'd feel comfortable and you'd, ah, oh, right, I'm here, you know? And so then from there, it's a lot easier to do everything else. Little Heart, I wrote being inspired by talking to a guy about it. He, he volunteered to work on a festival and he said because he volunteered to work on this festival, his granddad stopped talking to him because his granddad thought it was some pinko fag commie festival bullshit and made a political stance. And it just seemed so wrong, like it was a really misinformed action on his granddad's part. And I had some tea bags stuck on the wall, I was sort of staring at these tea bags, thinking about this idea. Senses 
starts to boil Live according to the season takes just the smallest of things. Sometimes I'll be driving and I get these ideas and I now carry like a, on the visor, I've got like a bit of paper and a pencil just to sort of write down one or two words. And driving and writing, trying to catch it before it disappears. Because you think you remember it, but you don't, you know. Tried to give me a big head start and threw it all away. Things not used, they don't sit around, they just disappear someday. The road can often be lonely, but that's often a good thing. I mean, you get some time to think, you get some time to look out the window. Alone, someone once told me, actually is abbreviated of all one. So when you're by yourself, you are all one, that's what you are. You are a complete unit. And that's, um, it's not something to be sneezed at in a way, it's kind of a luxury sometimes. I got my license really late. I was, think I was about 33 or something when I got my driver's license. And I had to get it for a movie I was in when they had cast me as this ex-jailbird, smoking, driving, gangster guy. And I um, had a meeting with the director and the, uh, the DOP, and the DOP said, oh, great, yeah, he'll be good. So um, he does drive, right? And uh, the director was like, yeah, yeah, I think so. And then he asked me and told me about the role, and I said, oh, well, I, haven't, I don't drive, I haven't got a license, and I gave up smoking. <laughs> so I had to smoke this revolting herbal tobacco for the film, and I had to get my license. So I had to go and do this driver's license in one week course in Frankfurt with an ex-military guy who, he was a freak, he, would, uh, he had this little moustache and would drive around and he would wind down the window and shout at Turkish people, sort of racist insults, it's really weird. And then we went over to Ireland and started driving, which was the opposite side of the road from Germany, and then went back to Germany and started filming there again, so it was the opposite side of the road again. and then. And all of this was the opposite side to what I'd grown up on riding a bike around New Zealand. I've got this saying that the driver has to be in the middle. So if I remember bad, I'm fine. commitment. The language barrier can be really interesting to see how... I mean, I, I remember sometimes on stage trying to talk to the audience in a language you just don't know, like Italian. And you're trying to f just trying to bash, like you can really, it's like you're bashing the brain to come up with ways to communicate. But sometimes when you're so tired, it's really hard. I was checking into a hotel in Holland and the people who had set up the gig had set up the accommodation in the hotel, but they hadn't told me you have to play a concert in the hotel foyer to pay the show. It's like a hostel and this is what they do to help out musicians. So I got to the hotel, the hostel, and I was trying to check in, and the guy's saying, oh yeah, but you, you have to play a show here to pay this room. And I was like, no way, I'm not gonna do that. And he was like, yeah, that's what they arranged. And I was looking at him, and he was looking at me, and he was trying to talk to me. And then just as we started talking, this Dutch African drumming troupe started to play in the foyer to pay for their room for the night. And suddenly this 
stilted conversation. We couldn't even talk because they were so loud. And he started trying to tell me something about how it had to be this way. And I just was so tired. And I just remember like just grabbing his arm and he just went, and he just stopped talking. And then I just said, you know, said what I had to say and then just let go of his arm. I, was, I couldn't even, I couldn't help it. It was just some weird reaction that you have, you know. You, this is how you deal with it. Often I'm surprised with the reaction of people that the stuff I do that I think is a bit more wacko, like this uh, pseudo-satanic chanting white zombies in the jungle song that I do called Way Down South is something that people really relate to and I always think, oh, should I do that one? It might be a bit much for this crowd here. And you play it and they're like, that's what the one they really respond to somehow. So I'm, I'm always at a, I'm always somehow trying to figure that out because what I see, the way I see what I do, I think it's got a mass appeal, but I know that's through Delaney's filter, you know? And I know it probably hasn't, but somehow I have this belief that a lot of people could get it, and somehow you have to get them to the point where they could be listening to this, this sort of outrageous din you're making, fist pumping in the air and chanting out, and they're totally into it. So somehow you can get them to this point, whereas if you played that right at the beginning, they would, they would just go away. And it always reminds me of that analogy with the frog, that if you put it in cold water and bring it to the boil, it won't notice and it'll eventually just die. But if you throw a frog into boiling water, it straight away will jump out, you know?
pretty much find the people who like what you do, if they know what you're doing, and they know you're coming to town, will come and see you, and you, you can make a real immediate and quite a profound connection with people from all around the world. Some people want to come, they want to run away with the circus, you know, and people have said that before, oh man, take me with you, this town sucks, you know, we hate it here. And you don't have that power to take them with you, I don't know what they think you're capable of. And I remember that as well, with getting along with bands and being like, fuck, you just want to, yeah, I'll come tomorrow, let's get out of here, let's just keep doing this. You could be right, perhaps you could be wrong. The videos I make, someone described to me once as, oh God, not another man walking video. I keep trying to get away from that, but it seems like it's become a really strong theme of some guy just walking. And for me, that kind of symbolises what I do, or most of us do in our life. We just walk. We're just going from one thing to another, or pointlessly walking. Yeah, I don't know if it's possible to stand still somehow. The children sleep at night. Your eyes say swim and I'll go home. They buy you drinks to keep you here A whiskey for an hour Your eyes, they swim in alcohol, you give away the flower. They buy you drinks to keep you here, a whiskey for an hour. And that's basically about someone being coerced into staying somewhere they might not be and might not want to be or might not be that good for them, and what they would lose through staying in an environment like that. The next verse talks about, I said goodbye to my hometown. The butcher still was sleeping. The smell of blood, the open road, were witness to me leaving. I did some work as a butcher when I was in Melbourne, and they start really early. You start at around five in the morning, so the idea that even the butcher's still asleep when this guy's leaving is, um, he must have left pretty early in the morning. That's kind of where that's going. Time Is Gone was a song I wrote about this feeling. I somehow came to me when I was in Switzerland. Time, the time has gone. The time you thought you had, you actually don't have it. The, um, time also as a character who leaves places and says goodbye all the time. And this idea that not only is time running out on you, but the times that you think of and hold dear, they're gone. Not like there's no more good times or something like that, but that you might think a lot about a time in your childhood or a time when you were at a certain period in your life and that's not there anymore. You took me away. I'm always aware that it's disappearing pretty fast and I'm always often a bit down on myself if I waste it. Like if I watch a movie, I'll be like, God damn it, that was like two hours. You could have done this, you could have done that. But then I know you need to be in the right place mentally to do something 
properly. So if you go to, you can be in the nicest place in the world, but if you're not, if you're really tired, you're just really tired, so. Some have a combination of all that would be nice to find. The balance there. Now the time is taken. When I was living in Switzerland, I started to do this solo show. And I'd tour Europe, and then I'd come back to New Zealand, do some more stuff here, go back over there. And then the periods I started coming back for got longer and longer until it was kind of balancing out six months New Zealand, six months in Europe. And then the earthquake happened, and that kind of, I guess the word I use for that is it galvanised me much more to feel like this was my home here in New Zealand. Stay, stand in the door, watch the world start rolling round the floor, down, down to the ground. gave me was time. It was, a, it was a feeling of having a completely open agenda. All bets were off. Most of the venues are gone. People were just really, really heavily into being where they were and connecting to the people they were around. And so you would walk down the street and you'd see someone you know and you'd, they'd just be sitting there. So you'd go over and hang out and you'd say hello and talk and drink coffee and I don't know, it felt like that's kind of how it felt, this, this, this massive amount of time. Definitely wrote a lot of songs at that time that were about that. And like most things, it's a time and it has a certain point. The stars align in a certain way and then they, they start to disperse back out into the, their various parts again, you know. So that was, I mean probably artistically that was a massive um, combining of forces with other people who are around. And that probably wouldn't have happened if the if we hadn't all been just thrown together in a ruined town. It was probably like living in some depressed little town in Indiana or something and there's a whole lot of time and no jobs. So people start to do what they do, nets or um, music. So somehow people just started doing a lot more music. Happy WOMAD times. Uh, rain's finished, I guess. Bought myself some gumboots. Talk at. When you've been on tour and you come back, I remember talking to another friend of mine about this. He talked about going back to his hometown after being on tour for a month or two and he just couldn't believe how slow everything seemed. And I think when you get on the road and you go through all these different 
towns, traffic laws start to become elastic, parking regulations become something you don't really care about, the speed limit becomes something completely theoretical. There's all these things you do to bend and fit in this strange machine you've got of this tour into the surrounding communities or towns you go into. I think Christchurch during the earthquake was a great training for road cones and a do not enter sign. Doesn't mean there's a hole in the road, it just means they don't want you to go in there, but you can still go in there and you can drive through that street. You just shift the road cone, that's all you have to do. And then parking on footpaths, doing a U-turn in a, some street you're not meant to, all these things, they just start to become what you have to do, husband and engineer this thing through all these different situations and then you get back to the town you live in and people are like, oh, yeah, oh, I'll have to go down that street and turn around before I come back out onto the street and, oh, it says no right turn here. I think it's interesting to see how that happens once you get back from a tour. You definitely have to readjust and you have to find a way to reconnect into the, um, into society in a way. It's kind of like being a pirate somehow. We're driving on the motorway to Tulsa from Wisconsin. Suddenly just looked at the fuel gauge and we're like, shit, we're totally out of gas. So we pulled off the ramp and as we got to the bottom of the ramp, the car just conked out, it had run out of gas. And we looked down and we saw this cop was sitting under the bridge and we went down to ask him and he, he took one of us away to get gas and we just thought we're never gonna see them again. But he came back and he pulled out um, a drink bottle, took the water all over the ground and he pulled out this knife and he just went, it was so sharp through the water bottle and used that to pour the gas into the car. And we said, thanks so much. And the only thing he said the whole time was, protect and serve, ma'am, protect and serve. And he got back in his car, and went and sat under the bridge and we drove off. And the other time a strange breakdown I had was um, having a blowout on the freeway. And that just, the car just started going like all over the place and we managed to get it under control, pull over to the side. And then we had to drive with this sort of limping up the highway to this part of Indiana and pull off. And we pulled into a gas station and the people there were just, it was like full of these huge guys, all with blonde hair, massive thick necks. We thought they were gonna eat us alive. And they just looked at us and they're like, what the hell are you guys doing here, you know? And uh, we found a tyre shop. We pulled out to the tyre shop and it just stunk. It smelled so bad. And it was like a garbage truck they were repairing. And it just had this evil liquid dripping out the bottom of it. And um, this guy looked at the car and he's like, oh yeah, I got one of those. And he said, come in here. And um, he had this sort of room and it was really dark and really hot. And he said, just back here. And there was a door at the back of the room and went through into the next dark room. And as you go into the room, it would be dark and then you'd turn the light on. And he said, it's just up here a bit. And there was a staircase going up. And just, just round here. I could just always hear this voice. I was kind of following him into the next room and then the light would go on walked through another room upstairs and then there was another door and he said, just in here. I walked in there and he turned the light on and he said, I call this the tire oven. And it was really hot and I was like, right. And suddenly, I mean, this thing, I was like, this is like a horror movie, you know, you go. And when I got into the room, I realized he's just trying to help, you know? And you get so terrified of these situations with foreign people and you have all this shit in your head from movies that you've seen about. This is the bit with the chainsaw. This is where the machete comes out. And that's just all total propaganda. And made me kind of, I guess I felt sad because it seemed like he was so trying to help and he wanted to get us a tire and would have, you know, it would have worked out. But people are just so scared of taking that chance and trusting someone.
I'm a thinking you need to do the slow. Yeah, the sun's getting low and the shadows getting taller. Life gets cold and the treetop branches release to the fire as the tree becomes ashes. It's so low Whale can dive to the bottom of the ocean Frozen time, frozen motion So far away So far away When I get there It's gonna be a better day So far away in a show where you're like, this is, what I'm doing such a great job. And then the next minute you're like, oh my God, I have to just stop this and get a job as a dishwasher. What the fuck was I even thinking, you know? I think you, you, you go those same, those same social heights and depths we end up having to traverse as a musician. You end up going through personally as an artist or as any creator, you know, you kind of, it's just so hard to do it without absolute belief and complete despair you need those to kick you through artistically somehow I read a book once and it was talking to a guy and he someone asked him did he believe in God and he said um, when I'm driving down the freeway at a million miles an hour in my car I believe in God but when I'm sitting at home in front of the fire I don't believe in God and that kind of to me explains somehow music is this godlike energy that people share and it connects them. And the only time they're really looking for connection is when they are going through a really a hard time. So they, that naturally makes them want to belong, they need comfort, they need support, they need to know they're not the only person who ever felt like they'd been left by someone they loved or somebody died in their life or things aren't working out how they wanted. They don't want to feel alone and so they want to be connected to other people. And music is a really great way for a lot of people to stand together and feel like they are connected by this common feeling. So Depressed was a song I'd listened to a couple of times by Abner Jay and really wanted to do a cover of. Um, it's an amazing song because it, the lyrics when you read them are so heavy and sad, but the way the song's structured, it just is so much about a release and about a, a crying out and some kind of a pain that this guy's in and how when you sing it, it really feels like it's up. It's an up song with an incredibly down lyric. I'm so depressed, help me somebody, I need some rest. That's a real feature of blues. I think uh, that's the one line people draw between blues and country is, blues is a release and I look to the future, and country is like a, a lot of crying and a way to be stuck to the past and not really trying to escape from the pain, more just enduring it, I guess. And so I'm So Depressed really kicks out as a, such a strong blues song because it, um, it's definitely superseding the pain that is professing at the same time. Must I cry? Will there be someone, someone to wipe and dry the tears from my
be doing it, maybe me. I mean, that was a bit, a lot of the thoughts earlier on for me was that I would like this to be something I could do and not get to the point where I was like, ah, oh, I'm too old for it or, you know? So I think musically that's gonna hopefully stay that way. But um, the idea of the eternal international big long tour, I don't know. I guess I'd like to think, like most people, what they thought or saw or had to say somehow was worthwhile and could relate to people and they would be interested in your perspective on things and what you could present would be interesting. I feel like with my life so far, I've had these three really, oh well obviously not counting childhood, that would be a fourth one, but I've had these really distinct different lives. I had quite a strong life as a, as a visual artist and that really was all consuming and I was doing a lot of painting and exhibiting, drawing all the time, really, really hard driven into that. Um, then I had 12 years working in kitchens and that was pretty all consuming for me. And then somehow the music just ended up coming out and, and from being something I'd always been interested in when I was young and trying to keep a hand in more hobby based art uh, that really took over and became pretty much the driving force in my life for the last 13 years.
Thank you.